You and I are each one of 8 billion people on this planet. We are the same in ways that matter, but unique in many other ways that also matter. Our humanity is what connects each and every one of us. Isn't that awesome? This is One of 8 Billion, a podcast about all of us. I'm your host, Ivan Stegic. In this podcast, we celebrate humanity. Each episode reveals someone's journey, one life, one human, one story. Our guests come from around the world, from a variety of backgrounds, each with their own unique path to now. We talk about our shared experiences, our common origins, our struggles, and what connects us. Discover how similar we all really are as you hear from a polar explorer, a meteorologist from America's Midwest, a software engineer from Argentina, and many other fellow humans. One of Eight Billion is produced by Ten Seven, a technology studio whose mission is to make things that matter. Online at ten seven dot com. Our guest today is polar explorer, educator, and environmental warrior Will Steger. From his early days climbing trees in his backyard to his pioneering work as a polar explorer, to his lifelong advocacy on environmental issues, Will Steger has been working to save our planet from a very early age. Besides his groundbreaking expedition to the North Pole, he also put together an international team with members from the six most powerful countries on the planet for another expedition, that time to Antarctica, Join me in this episode in which Will discusses the path that led him to be the leader in the battle to save our planet. Would you please introduce yourself? Here's the intro. Will Seeger, Will. educator and explorer. That our guest today <laughs> is polar explorer, explorer that educator, rolls nicely off the an tongue. environmental I've seen warrior. Your Wikipedia entry. Will it says Steger. you are more than just an explorer. From you're his a early polar days, explorer. climbing trees in his That's backyard. That's amazing. Could you tell me a little bit about a your polar right now? What does to his life lifelong Will advocacy look like right now on environmental right now, issues? I run two nonprofits, Climate Generation, which I formed in World Two when the Larsen Ice Shelf broke up, and age. we have a staff of 19, and we work Besides in his groundbreaking K-12 expedition education, to the North youth Pole, organizing, he and also policy. put together an the, international the team was, with members from came down the six most powerful countries on the planet. Climate for movement. another expedition and then my other that time organization which i'm just launching now is the steger join Center me in this episode for innovation in leadership. which will discuss the incorporated about six years that led him to be the leader it's taken that long to really get it organized to save our higher on staff now and the steger center is really about the direction forward we we have a climate now that's out of control and there's a lot of opportunities but we're going to have to adapt around it it's about bringing the best of minds together almost like a wilderness Camp David. Camp David was a mm. model that I used years ago where you get the higher level decision makers, policy makers, you get them into the wilderness in a unique area, and then you close the door and you, you work out these problems. And there certainly are a great deal of problems that we have in the world these days and affecting so many different people all over the planet. Our podcast's name is One of Eight Billion, and to me, it makes me feel very small when I think of myself in terms of eight billion others, but it also makes me feel very large as well. It makes me feel connected and disconnected at the same time. When I say that you are one of eight billion, just like I am, how does that make you feel? What thoughts come to mind? I got a big family out there. A lot of great people, and we're all in this together. It's what I think about. We are 8 billion strong, and we really have to rally around the challenges today and, and figure out how are we going to live in peace and harmony with nature as 8 billion people? That's the question. It's a great question. So that's the here and now. I'd like to go to where life started for you. Where were you born? What did life look like when you were first alive? 
Let me talk about my conception, first of all. <laughs> my dad was in World War II, of course. And in 1942, I think it was, he was being shipped off in San Francisco to fight in the Pacific. And my mother was a farm girl, already had one child. And so she took the train out alone to San Francisco to visit my dad. And he had a leave. So when she got there, they canceled the leave. And my father, along with two others, went under the fence. And the other two got caught, but my dad fortunately got under <laughs> And I was conceived that night in the hotel room, and I was given his name. His name is William. They didn't want a junior, but they gave me his name, William, because they didn't know if he was coming back. And so he went out oh. to fight, and very fortunately, he returned and had six more children. When I was born was 1944. I'm a war baby. In other words, my father was gone for two years. I didn't see him. I don't recall it, but my mother told me I was really afraid of him when he first came. And I grew up in the late 40s and in 50s. I think it was a very good era. Everybody was together as a nation at that time. It was really quite incredible. Lots of opportunities. My dad then started his own business. He's an entrepreneur. And he did raise his nine kids on his ideas and so forth. In other words, he, you know, really, it was a serious thing. It wasn't just a business that he could be really relaxed and he had, he had a support. So it was a serious thing, and he did, but he did that on his mind and his inventions and what he was, his patents that he did. So because of my upbringing, I thank my parents for where I'm at today and every great thing that has come to me because they gave us as kids uh, almost total freedom. We were expected to get a certain grade point average and had to stay out of trouble with the law. And then if we wanted to do anything, we had to pay for it. So that was the rules. And then I, I really took advantage of that. And 12 years old, I told my dad I wanted to go down the Mississippi River. I had read Huck Finn. And he said, yeah, you can do it, but you have to have a good boat, which meant I, I worked three full years to save the money. And then recruited my brother at 17. We went to New Orleans, and then we went all the way back up. I started climbing when I was 19. And I did major expeditions in my later teens. First ascents at 20,000 feet and so forth, all, all because of... I had that freedom. So I grew up as a youth not seeing any boundaries. If I wanted to do something, I could do it. I could work hard. I had the discipline. And, and I wasn't defeated in my mind, my boundaries. Because you're always, any goal you set, you're first defeated in your mind, especially larger expeditions like that. So many people have this dream, but they, they just can't get it. Especially when you're challenged in a very severe situation, it's always your mind that if you're going to survive, you got to really have a, have a good mind that way. So mm-hmm. that's what I got from my parents. And then I made the rest of my fortune, my good luck with that incredible attitude. My parents also had a very loving relation, which, of course, was the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had a stable family and uh, we very close family. And all of this happened in Minnesota? Yes. I was born and raised in my first six years in Mita Midai, which is a, almost a rural area just north of North St. Paul. And that was uh, very important to me because there across the street, it was, it was really open country or open forest. And that to me, the forest was a frontier. And it was actually considerable forest. I was able to live as a child within close to nature, climbing trees and all that. And ever since I can remember, I played with Lincoln Logs, these little log cabins. Mm-hmm. And that's really what I want to do with my life. I visualized myself as a pioneer going over the Rockies and starting a homestead. And that's pretty much what I did with my life. I followed through with that. But then we moved to Richfield, which was a first string suburb out of Minneapolis and South Minneapolis. And that was a typical World War II post-war community. It was mm-hmm. once uh, cornfields and right up through the war, it was turned into, a, at that time, an early suburb. But everything was plotted out and so forth, no trees. And that was where I, most of my life I lived in that area. But still, at that time, being less than a mile from the regular city, it was still pretty wild there. There's still places to run and have fun. And that's all changed, of course, right now. But it it was a very good time. In school, I was what they called a slow learner, (laughs) which (laughs) in in grade school, it wasn't like it was now where people were recognized. The slow learners were dunces. (laughs) I mean, we sat in a (laughs) certain group in the classroom, and it it wasn't (laughs) where you didn't want to be labeled that. But so I was left-handed. I was dyslexic. And so I had trouble with math. 
and the English grammar, spelling, the whole works. But I was social enough and, and athletic enough that I could, because of that, I was going to override that stigma, social stigma. I had to work so much harder than anyone else to get a grade. But I felt it was good for me because, first of all, it was very humbling as a kid. So, And I, I, I come from a humble background, too. And, uh, and I started climbing walls and rocks and stuff from 17, 18 year old. So I, I had that sense of, I wasn't greater than anyone. I think that mm-hmm. was very important to myself. I saw myself always as an equal. I didn't see myself as intelligent because I couldn't get the big marks that intelligence was like A, B and C, you know, if you're A or L intelligent, but I knew I had something that was really unique in myself. I recognize that. And I always had a vision, a clear vision in my life. I knew I was going to be a teacher, although I hated school, but I knew that's the direction, you know, that would be my livelihood. And uh, and like many kids, I had this incredible adventurous spirit, but but because of the freedom, I took that so much further than anyone took it at, at that age. And, and it was a good, it was a good life and a good... Uh, the only thing I liked about school was really the social part of it. I think all <laughs> kids relate to that. I had a natural interest in, I wanted to be a climatologist. I started keeping weather records when I was eight, back in 52. I still actually keep records. And then I had a strong interest in astronomy. In our house, you got one big present at Christmas. That was always a really big deal. And I remember in fourth grade, underneath the tree was a telescope. You know, I had to assemble mm. it, the four-inch reflector. And uh, I will never forget my first views of the heaven of the Orion Nebula, the rings of Saturn, mm. the moons of Jupiter. I was so inspired. I learned all the constellations. I knew their Greek and, and Arabic names and also the history between not only the constellations, but each name. My philosophy of education has always been we bring the curiosity out. Of, of your student or the kid, and, and then you just add content. And that that was very typical with me. I was on fire about astronomy, and the kid that couldn't do math was like reading Arabic and uh, studying <laughs> Arabic because that's where my interest was. And uh, and all the, uh, the weather and astronomy were, turned out to be uh, very important as, as I grew up and explored more, and my survival depended on the ability to read weather and navigate by the mm-hmm. stars. I always was reading on the on my groove from the very beginning. I, when you're getting into your teenagers and twenties and so forth, you do get out the groove. You travel. You, you you make your mistakes and so forth. I'm not saying that my life was just straight on up, but I knew where I was going. It was very clear to me. I never talked about anybody. I never even talked about myself about it. But I, and then I I moved forward. You talked about wanting to be a teacher and an educator, and that you were interested in astronomy and the weather. When did you realize you were an explorer and that was a thing? The, the first memory I can remember was going outside, maybe four or five. And that was it. I was an that explorer. Was it. I was there. I was climbing up big trees. My parents never stopped me for anything. It's amazing. Climbing huge trees, just go up to examine the birds and the, uh, the, the eggs and uh, robin egg or whatever it was that was there. I was curious about it. So I think yeah. most young kids are explorers at heart, and yeah. and I, and that because of my freedom and and because of the environment of that era, I was able to you know follow through. In your life, have you ever had a memorable leader, a boss you reported to, and what do you think you learned from them? My hero was Huck Finn. Again trouble with reading left-handed uh, we had a book report in fourth grade and I, I chose Huck Finn which was a huge book and I mean I was Huck that's the same thing I think with many people mm-hmm. kids that read it I was Huck and I couldn't put that book down I, and uh, so Huck was my hero I never really had any real mentors like a boy scout cub scout type relationship I had I was always after information and knowledge I sought out older people for their wisdom and my sense of learning how to photograph. I've been photographing since I was, you know, eight. I had a little brownie camera, but I usually I went into that. For, I mean, I was a professional photographer in expeditions and that. I remember when I was in, must have been 13 or 14, a guy in the next block made these 16 millimeter movies. And he took me under his wing and, and told me all about settings and, and exposures and all this. But I had many men and women that I sought out that taught me 
not a, not so much as you know a teacher thing, but I was after their knowledge, and and I've always too wanted to learn the knowledge of living off the land and being self-sufficient, like homesteading. Uh, that was a big interest to me, and all, all the old timers. And then I traveled down the rivers. I, I kayaked over 10,000 miles in the Arctic area before I was 23. And I went down the Mackenzie Yukon. And, and along the way, we met there's villages and native people and missionaries and miners and trappers. And I was very interested in these people, the stories that they had to tell. I, I lived a life of experience. And, and also meeting people and learning what could I learn from these people. I was yeah. wide open as a kid. I could adjust to whatever the social thing I was in. I, I hitchhiked over 100,000 miles before I was 24. Hot freights, that whole thing in the freight yard and the hobos. And when I was you know, a teenager, figuring that out. So I, I made my own path. I talked to my parents when they were older and I asked them what was it like raising me. And they're big cons- <laughs> Good question, yes. Yeah, I wish I would have asked, asked it. Or maybe I'm glad I asked them towards their older. But they were always afraid of climbing. I was on an expedition and when I was 20, doing uh, first ascents on 20,000 feet. And two men fell and died. And we buried them in a crevasse at 18,000 feet. And, <gasps> and then uh, they said that we were always concerned. They called it that, climbing, the climbing. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. They were afraid of me dying. And they never put a barrier in front of me. And that's how cool these parents uh, were and what just, wonderful just, things to give you yeah, what a great yeah. gift that they enabled you to do that yep yep wow and, uh, you've traveled so many miles in your life you're the first person to dog sled up in the arctic the first confirmed dog sled journey to the north pole and you've done so many things and covered so many miles i'm sure you've had struggles and many challenges in your life what has been your greatest struggle in life? And maybe it's not even related to the trips you've taken. It's a very good question. Yeah, I would call it a struggle. Part of a struggle, it was activating the vision that I saw for myself. It wasn't for myself. It was really for uh, life on the planet, the preservation mm-hmm. of the wild spaces and the animals. And uh, that's why I saw myself as an educator. I was uh, young during the whole Vietnam era episode from age 18 to 25. If you could make it through to your 25, they wouldn't draft you. And this is all through the height of the war. And uh, so I stayed in school. I was going to go to school anyways, but I, I taught. And what I did is I got my credentials. I needed to be, I felt certified. I had my uh, undergraduate degree in the sciences, geology, biology, with a teaching certificate, which enabled me to and teach, and I felt I needed, uh, I didn't see myself as a school teacher, but I needed that experience. So I did that, taught for three years, and at the same time I got my master's. And then and then I had my credentials, I was in Minneapolis, and then in 25 I left to live in the wilderness. Going to the wilderness was not a reaction to the city. I, I, I was fine in the city, I had lots of friends. It wasn't my choice place, I wanted to live in the wilderness. So 25 I moved out. And then I started uh, winter school uh, with dog sledding and skiing. But all along, my expeditions all were a means to an end to do the Steger Center for Innovation and Leadership, which I, I'm now just as in 22 now, I'm launching that. I've been working on that for about six years to get it to the point where I can run it on a professional basis. But to me, it was all about the education. In 2002, the Larsen Ice Shelf in Antarctica collapsed, which was a major event. We had crossed Antarctica 3,700 miles in 1989-90, and we took us 15 days to cross that. And I taught climate in my classes in the late 60s, but that was was my call to action uh, about the mm. climate. I knew the climate. I studied the climate all my life, and I knew it. I didn't jump on any bandwagon. So I moved to the city from Ely, where I was living, and to really help start the climate movement. And, uh, and that was a great struggle to get that going, but it's you know really, really paid off. It's the work of trying to be most effective with your life. And uh, gradually through expeditions and the nonprofits, I've worked myself into a position of leadership and having a very unique wilderness setting for the Stiger Center, which I've been building now for almost 40 years. Again, not telling anybody what I was really up to. <laughs> 
it's the struggle to preserve the wilderness, to preserve life on the planet. And you're doing that through education and awareness and creating through innovation and leadership is where I'm always at. But that's a very good question that you ask. But I learned early on when you're working in the environment seriously and you're, in your, on the very front level of starting whatever it might be. It might be an education program. It might be a movement. I, I understood that it's like pushing a big ball up the hill. And sometimes that ball rolls back on your feet and it hurts like hell. But then you just keep going. You don't have to, you just keep going. So it's not like a actual where I'm struggling emotionally or anything like that, but it's a constant commitment of purpose Mm -hmm. towards making my life out of something that will have a purpose and a purpose in the greater good. When you die, you're die, you're not around. Your spirit has left you where it's going to go. And the idea of having a street or something or an image of yourself perpetuating is really dumb. But to just be part of that energy and part of that spirit. And the best thing is that if you do it right, when you go, no one knows what work and whatever, but it carries forward. So that's very important. We have children for that reason, but I see it a lot, lot larger picture than just having children. I never had any children of my own. I raised a couple children with Patty Steger. We homeschooled them in the wilderness, which was a lot of fun. I have come up a big family, so I'm very secure. I, I feel I don't need to reproduce. Mm-hmm. I have that great family, but my commitment was really in my life is to the children. I always looked at the children of the world as my children. And children grow up, but there's that stage of that perpetual spirit of a child will grow. It, it stays the same, like three or four years, five years, whatever the child is. That child will move out of that, but that spirit of a childhood is always it's something that's always there as part of humanity. And that's where I've been. That's why I look at things. That's beautiful. You mentioned the 3,700-mile trans-Antarctic expedition that you took. Why did you do that? What was the purpose of that? The purpose was incredible. You talked about the North Pole expedition. That was my mm-hmm. first major expedition. And, and it was all the experts said you could not reach the North Pole from land to the pole unsupported. It meant, uh, you know, all, carry all your food and everything. We also navigated by sextant before GPS. I organized mm-hmm. 50 dogs, eight people, and we set off to do that. And uh, it was 500 miles from land to the pole. We were out about 200 miles a month into the expedition. We're on moving ice the size of Arctic Ocean, the size of Mexico and the U.S. The ice is breaking up and moving, and you can't see any more than a half a mile. But by rare coincidence, there's only one other person out there, a French physician by the name of John Louis Atten, that left to do a solo expedition. And the year before, he tried it and made it 18 miles. I knew he he was tempting it, but I didn't think he'd make very far. But we literally ran into each other in the middle of the Arctic Ocean by this incredible Stanley Livingston, the chances of one of eight billion of that happening. <laughs> and then we right. met in his tent. The explorers come together. They talk about first your present trip, and then the, it goes immediately, what are you doing next? So I pulled out a map that I had and I and with a r- route on the longest possible route across Antarctica, something I don't think anyone even imagined could be possible. And I said, if I succeed in, on this expedition, this is what I, I'm going to do next. And he looked at that and he was just speechless for a bit. And then he looked up to me and he says, Will, he says, I think you'll need a doctor on this expedition. So that was our commitment. And we talked in the tent about we were doing a personal best that, that we were really tired of doing the personal best. And even both of us, we thought we might have to move on away from expeditions. But what the discussion came was in 1989-90, the Antarctic Treaty that set aside Antarctica was signed in 1960 during the Cold War. And it, it set the continent for science only, international cooperation, open inspections, no, no territory, no military and no nuclear, which was an incredible treaty. But in 1960, they said, we'll open it up and review in 1990. So the Antarctic Treaty was up for review in 90, and we met now in 86. But we knew that the treaty nations, 29 of them, at that time had just met, and behind closed doors, they were going to open up Antarctica for exploration for minerals. Mm. So that would have been the, the beginning of the end of 
of that environment. So, and we, that just happened behind closed doors. We knew the, you know, cause we're privy to the polar stuff. So we, we knew the inside on that. So right then and there, we thought, we said we would form an international expedition. And we decided that we would do six countries of the most powerful countries, which were the US, France, England, Japan, the Soviet Union, and China. And then we would do the long route and attract huge media attention to make Antarctica famous, basically, and to draw attention mm-hmm. to this treaty. The expedition itself, we almost perished a number of times. We were beyond anything I've ever experienced. But some providence was with us because I know I, I had a sense we would not die because what we were doing, and so many countries came along on this during that three years of organization. So we made it across. We made over 2.5 billion media impressions around the world where everyone around the world was talking about. So then we met with the world leaders, President Bush, President of China, President Mitran, the Prime Minister of Japan, the Prime Minister of Australia. We needed all 29 votes. And then in the end, we got all 29 votes and Antarctica was preserved. And it was important because back in 1989-90, we knew that something was changing in Antarctica. We knew it was climate change, but we didn't have the data. But if this treaty would have went the other way and they started mining, all the science would have went into exploring for you know commercial. But in 89-90, it was imperative that we get the data that we needed in order to build a policy, because when you're building a climate policy, you have to have scientific data. So that's why this treaty was also important, to get the data so we could do the policy, so we could start addressing through policies here the the climate change. Each one of my larger expeditions were platforms for, usually platforms for something environmental in the polar regions. So we were able through the internet then to bring that real time to the public. And so that's pretty much my life there. The Transantarctic Expedition sounds like an inflection point in the world. And it sounds like it could have gone the other way had you not done this. Do you feel like there've been other inflection points since then? Is there one happening right now? That's a good question too. In 1990, ironically, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere reached 350 parts per million. And this is the threshold that the climate scientists predicted, 350 parts per million, the ice would start melting on the planet. And that essentially was the beginning of climate change. And uh, right now it's about 420 parts per million. I mean, it's really in the danger red zone. But that was the tipping point actually for the climate was in 1990 at 350. Because once the ice started melting, that then changed everything. And ironically, in my history, I spent the first 25, 30 years in the Arctic regions when it was cold and normal. And then the last 30 years now, I've experienced it. I've literally been on the ice in both polar areas. And when the ice is melting and breaking up, for example, the Arctic Ocean, which we did in a, across in 1986, you no longer can reach the North Pole from land. All the ice shelves, both North Pole and South Pole that I've crossed are all gone. All the routes that I've done are not possible to ever do them again because they don't exist. Mm -hmm. 1990 was was the beginning. And then the ice shelves started breaking up there. The Larsen that we crossed in 02, the Larsen ice shelf broke, which part of the Antarctic expedition. And then then it all started. And it just wasn't until the big change happened, maybe six, seven years ago when we were for the first time really seeing the changes in civilization and people became their own eyewitnesses. Now, the last summer was a point that I didn't know if I'd be living when this happened, but I feel this summer we got the message that the climate is now going out of control. And that's a, that's another pivotal time for humankind now to, to face this issue. And I think it's important that we look at it and face up to it. And most of us are adults and we can take on some bad news. And we have to look at, we okay, this is the situation now and this is not going to be reversed. How do we start cooperating and moving forward 
it's not just it doesn't even have a solution in some ways but we have to adapt it's all about adaptation and we have all the technology on hand we have all the tools here to pull this out there's going to be consequences sea level you know, i wouldn't buy any property in miami miami is not going to be around 50 years from now it's all going to change that all started in 1990 all the changes and now it's we're all seeing it so what I think I just heard you say, which is sobering and sad and worrying, is that there really isn't a way to reverse this, that as a humanity, we need to adapt to what's coming and make intelligent decisions based on the fact that it won't change? There is no reversing it, period. We will not go back to the winters and the seasons and that. We're humans. We're adaptable. And our numbers are... We're overpopulated, 8 billion, that's it. The mm -hmm. Earth can't, that's, a, that's an issue, but we're just going to have to adapt. But like I say, there's the incredible miracles of science and technologies and everything mm -hmm. that's coming about. You never know. There is even a possibility of starting slowly to reverse this. To uh, We first have to level out our carbon. When There'll be a, a great day when we're leveling our carbon, so it's that carbon dioxide is not increasing. That's going to be a hallmark because that is going to be the success and then we have to look at reducing it but there will even be in the future i don't think it'll be in our future but the ability of taking the, some of this carbon out and over the long run there could be a possibility then of our survival i like the idea of us surviving yeah i like the idea of us surviving too I, I was just going to comment on that. It's a nice idea that we survive. And I appreciate the focus on the reality and the, the things that we need to do to make things better. But I would like to ask you something that that's maybe a little different. And that is, what brings you joy these days? What actually makes you smile? Yeah, that's the challenge. That's always a challenge. Because uh, how do you keep your joy and your yeah. happiness intact when you're looking at overwhelming things? That's the key to life. Mm -hmm. um, and the key to life is living in the moment and not being taken down by whatever is going on around you. I'm just trying to think how to explain that. I do look at that. I look at that myself. For myself, what's happening, I consider it a, I'm more of, as an observer, an active observer, because I'm trying to do something about it. But at the same time, if we have to keep a positive mind, like I mentioned from my parents, what I've learned because they gave me the freedom, I didn't see barriers. And, and I faced a lot of so many overwhelming odds in my life, survival or otherwise. And it's always that the mental part of being positive, being, if you can, joyful and happy, because it's within that positive state of mind. And that's in the moment is where the solutions and adaptation comes. Because mm -hmm. the issue right now Yes, if we're facing an overwhelming challenge, the average person will just give up. And, uh, and that's the exact opposite of what, where we need to go. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of humans. It's not the end of life. But we got an adaptation in our species all the way through, I'm sure, if you could figure out how far back we go, have faced more overwhelming issues in the, than what we face Chinese. right now. Mm -hmm. One final question. What do you hope you'll see in your lifetime? I would like to see in my lifetime cooperation, peace, but there's always going to be some disruptions. But I'd like to see people cooperate. And we saw that. We demonstrated that in Antarctica when all the countries came together around that. It was an incredible thing to be part of that. And, and the most discouraging thing right now for me is that we're divided and therefore the most encouraging thing for me to see is that we're all working together and figuring out how are we going to do this, how are we going to adapt. And the future is great for us because we have to change literally moving forward. Our, it's not just our energy systems, but we're using technology and so forth. We're going to be living in a different world, which is going to be a little simpler, but much higher quality. 20 years from now, I'm in Minneapolis here. 20 years from now, the, there won't be any pollution. I don't, even the air in Minneapolis seems clean, but I, I'm not running too much in it and inhaling deeply. And Minneapolis is a clean city. But 20 years from now, we're going to live in a much cleaner world. Civilization advances. 
it advances and it retreats and back and forth. And there's a good world to come to, but we all have to be part of being positive and educating ourselves, but doing what we can. But I, I would say in conclusion, we're lacking, I think, today is tolerance. We really have to have more respect for each other. And the world of, of tolerance is so important so we can be together. In Antarctica, we, I mentioned we almost perished a number of times. And we had a saying amongst ourselves, if we were one straw standing in, in this wind, we would perish. But we were six straws, therefore we survived. And the, the solutions going forward, of course, is the social engagement and being together. And together, we'll figure this out. And the economic possibilities are enormous. All the investment in clean energy and everything else, this is a huge employer. If it was economically dire straits we were moving into, it would be really tough. But it's the opposite. We've got so many opportunities. My father, who was an entrepreneur, if he would be living today, boy, he would be excited and all over about these possibilities. The possibilities of working and doing things that are making a difference and helping people and retaining our uh, life and our wilderness at the same time. I feel inspired and <laughs> humbled by what you said. And I, I thank you for being on the show. I thank you for being one of 8 Great. billion with me. Thank you for your time. It's precious. And I'm grateful that you spent it with me. And I really enjoyed talking with you. Okay. Thank you. Good questions. In the next episode of One of 8 Billion, we visit with Kristen Womack, a Principal Program Manager Lead at Microsoft. What connects us all? For me, I think that it is that we depend on each other. We're created in this way or we exist in this way that it's difficult, if not impossible, to exist without your community or your group of other humans. To be in community and to work to build something requires togetherness. And the sooner that we move into that sort of as an acceptance and realize that we benefit from helping others and we also benefit from accepting help from others and that we're happiest when we're working together with each other. Cooperation. I hope you'll join us. This has been One of Eight Billion, a podcast about all of us, online at oneof8b.com. Join us again next time as we celebrate humanity together. I'm Ivan Stegich. Thank you for listening. One of 8 Billion is produced by Tent7, a technology studio whose mission is to make things that matter. Find out more at tent7.com. You must already.